Hi, my name is Pastor Ronald Kozar, and I'm the senior pastor at Alpha Lions Dead Ministries in Derry, Pennsylvania. I'm just an old football player that has been saved by grace. I played several years with the New England Patriots and with the Detroit Lions. I just want to take this opportunity to welcome you into one of our services. For some people, as they look at the numbers in some churches today, because some churches have a lot more numbers than what we do, but if numbers don't impress you, you have to look at the truth of what's being taught. And when I look at the truth of, well, when I look at, being, when I look at what's being said, at some places, I wonder, are we already at the beginning of the great falling away? Amen. Amen. And that's what I asked the Lord. I mean, I, I was in a, in a service there that everybody would have just thought was the greatest service in the world. And I'm sitting there and my heart's broken. and I'm asking God, are we in the beginning of the great falling away? I mean, can you understand that? Can you wrap your mind around that there, there is a portion of the church right now that's going in a total opposite direction regarding the truth of God's Word? And there is a remnant, there is a people that God has chose to share a truth to, and they're migrating to truth. So there, there's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. Amen? I, I just want to be on the right side. I want to be where God has called me to be. So how do we know that? How do we know that we're doing what God has called us to do? It's His Word. You, you can't go by numbers. You can't go by, well, I think this, I thought that. No, that's not what this means, this means that. You know, I actually heard this morning on one of the major networks that a woman who posed to be a black person, I mean, she painted herself black, she did the whole black thing, she was a part of the NAACP, and she was a head of some, some different organization. She did this for years. And then they caught her. Now, a lot of the, the, the um, African-American people, they're really upset because she posed to be a black person. And now she's writing a book on it, so now they're really upset because she's making money off what she did. And, and do you know what she's saying now? She's saying that she is like a transgender, but a person that wants a transgender from white to black. And she's saying, now, why is there a problem with that if people have their Issues to where they don't know if a male's a male and a female's a female. She said, why, why would people have a problem with me being a white person who I think I'm black? And listen, people were supporting her. Listen, we are living in times unlike any other. And listen, we've been preaching this for years. There is going to be a great falling away. Now, as far as I'm concerned, getting back to my message and away from my little vacation, because, I, I mean, the vacation was great, but it's not greater than the Word. Amen. 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 So my little sickness and some of the issues that I had to get over there, see, we was learned to share everything, so my wife shared a little intestinal virus with me. But, you know, I, I just should have took the advice of when we was in the emergency room, and I'm looking at those scriptures on the wall there, and the doctor comes in and he said, I really don't think it's this and that. I think it could be this. Why well, didn't believe that? I rebuked that. And I said, he said, there has been one of the most violent he used the word violent, intestinal flus that he had ever seen. People were just flocking to the emergency room. And he said, it is so contagious. And, and I should have heeded his voice and tried to kind of stay away from her a little bit, but I didn't do that. So I had to pay the price a couple days later when the bug jumped on me. But 
Then I talked to Al yesterday, and he goes, man, you sound great. I said, the problem isn't coming out my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 26. Let's get into the Word. Listen, this month, this is the month of April or Abib. This is God's first month of the year. This is one of the most important months in the history of the world. <coughs> Within this month is the most important day in the history of the world. Now what you need to ask yourself is do you know what day that is? And do you honor God on that day? See, we believe in appointed times. We believe that there are certain things that God told us to do, that we must do them on them certain days. We must honor God at certain times of the year. Now, this month is the Passover. I'm not talking about Ishtar or Oster because I'm not into worshiping a rabbit and a bunch of chicken eggs. I want to celebrate the Passover. Amen. Now God told us in the first month, the 15th day of the first month, you shall honor the Passover. Now, did Jesus do that? Amen. Why did Jesus even come <laughs> to the earth? And I, I even hear people, they'll, they'll tell you everything to avoid the Passover. Amen. Now listen, for 35 years, I believe pretty much the way everybody else believed, well, probably for about 25 to 30 years of my first beginnings of my Christian walk, but I always had the question, what does a rabbit have to do with chicken eggs? And what does a rabbit that have chicken eggs have anything to do with Jesus? So these questions always rumbled around in my spirit, in my soul. And then I used to think, well, okay, we have this thing called Good Friday. And then we have this thing called Eshtar or Oster Sunday. And I always knew that Jesus himself said that he would be in the tomb for three full days and three nights. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. The Son of Man also has to be in the belly of the earth for three full days and three full nights. So from Friday till before Sunday morning, because we know that the Bible clearly teaches us that early in the morning of the first day of the week when they went to the tomb, Jesus was already gone. So if Sunday's the first day of the week, Jesus was already gone there. So how could he have possibly been buried on Friday evening and resurrected before Sunday morning? And how are you going to fit three days in that period? The fact of the matter is, is you cannot do that. So if you can't do that, there's a problem with the way that we've been taught. So my question to you this morning is this. If that is not the truth, then what is the truth? If Abib or April is the most important day, month of the year, and within that month is the most important day of the year, do we honor God on that day, and do we even honor Him the way He told us to honor Him? Now, now God bless, you know, certain... Um, Christians in different churches, I mean, they believe they're still honoring God through Estar or Oster. You need to look it up. You need to Google them words. Google them up and find out what really Easter means. It was a, the worship of a pagan goddess, a rabbit that was about eight to ten foot tall. And those little chicken eggs that they have, those were fertility eggs. And they used to fill those eggs with money and offer them up to the foreign god. And that's where it comes, or some of our churches and some of our children are taught to do these little Eshter or Oster egg hunts. That's where they come from. 
So we want to know the truth about what this is all about. Now, because I believe it's filtered into all the holidays, we, on April 1st, or ABIB 1st, the devil has taught everybody to say April Fool's. Because most people that really don't know the truth about the Passover and they're worshiping foreign gods in ignorance, the devil has made up, what, where'd April Fool's come from anyway? It's like the devil making a mockery of the people on the earth saying, oh, look, you're an April Fool, you're an April Fool, you're an April Fool. Everybody's like an April Fool because they don't even know what the Passover is. They've been celebrating and worshiping a foreign god. Now, people may say they don't, but you need to examine it because you can't do both. Then, then listen to this, my friend. A lot of Christians with good intentions. Listen, I understand that people have good intentions. I had good intentions. And I don't want my preaching or teaching to come across as condemning. I want it, if need be, to be uh, conviction. Not condemning, but conviction. And if conviction convicts you, then that's what you have to decide between you and God. But even as I began to see the truth, I thought, well, okay, I, I know it's not Esther or Oster, so I'm just going to say... Happy Resurrection Day. And I'm going to celebrate it on Easter Sunday. This is my own personal road that I was on. But I didn't have a piece about that either. Because I know Jesus was already resurrected and it wasn't on Sunday. So why is everybody celebrating the resurrection on every Easter Sunday on this Eshtar Sunday? So I struggled with this and struggled with this over the years. And I thought, well, wait a second. Then, to be honest with you, when we, when we partake of this communion this morning. This is Pastor Rowan. First of all, I just want to thank you for tuning in and listening to our sermons. You know, we're looking for truth seekers. The Bible says that, that God is looking for them who worship him in spirit and in truth. So I really thank you for tuning in to our message today. Um, following, you're going to see an information page for those of you who want to donate to our ministry. I'll, I'll just simply be honest with you. We cannot do what we do without your financial support. So we totally rely upon your free will donations and offerings to our ministries. So on this following, you're going to see an information page with all of our information on there. So we really thank you in advance for giving. And we look forward to seeing you here, there, or in the air. God bless you. That is honoring the Passover. And listen, Jesus said this. These words come out of Jesus' mouth. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you shall proclaim, which means preach, teach, and instruct, my death until I return. So Jesus told us through the communion itself, through the Passover meal itself, when you celebrate my Passover, you will celebrate my death. But most Christians are taught to celebrate the resurrection. And to look forward to Easter or Oster, and I'm telling you, it's not the same day. Like, like the majority of the people on the earth today, they don't even know when Passover is this month. You're not even mindful of the Passover this month. And, and I'll tell you this too, because we're going to get into this, but I, I'm, I don't take up an offering, but I want you to know how to give and when to give. There are three times of the year that you must give. And Christians are never taught that. <clears throat> They're Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. Those are three times of the year that God says you must give. And if you do, there are eight blessings that follow that. And I can prove that word for word by the Scripture. And if you don't, that's why your finances are cursed. That's why sickness enters into your house. That's why things happen to you that you wonder, listen, why are my children under a curse? 
Why is things happening in my family that should not be happening? Well, there are reasons why. And you should be able to go to God and say, listen, why is this happening to me? This shouldn't be happening because I know I'm doing this, this, and that. I'm honoring you. So through this April, through, through this ABIB, I hope to explain to you and to clarify some of these issues. Because you need to know when Jesus was crucified. Is it clear in the Bible? I, I think it's as clear as can be. So I said to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 26. I want to start in verse 31. Well, let's say 30. Matthew 26, verse 30. And then when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me. This, this, this appointed time, this Moedim, this night, this was an appointed time. This was a determined, predestined time of God. So he said, This night, for it is written, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy. He said, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after, after I have been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. Now here's another thing that we preach, teach, and instruct at this, at this church. That it's like from going from point A to point B. Z, let's say. There's a process that God must take you through to get you where you need to be in his kingdom. And sometimes that's chipping away your old flesh. Sometimes that's teaching you something new in the kingdom for you to get to where God wants you to be. To be the man or the woman that, you've called, that you're called to be. Listen, <laughs> let, let me just tell you this. In order to understand all this and understand what really happened in the kingdom, Wrap your mind around this. Try to stick with me one second. When, when Jesus came to the earth, we know that he came, he was born, he was crucified, he died, he resurrected. But after that, the temple was destroyed. In 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. And right after that period, all the, all the Jews were destroyed. In the Romans, the Romans took over the world. There was a one world rule. And in that one world rule, there was a man by the name of Constantine. And within that rule, they created this Catholic, this religion that ruled the world. Now, the, the number one thing that they wanted to do is they wanted to eliminate everything Jewish. So they killed off all the Jews in his main function and purpose was to do away with God's feast days. So they, that Roman Catholic one world organization instruction created what we know as holidays. So you need to be able to choose between God's holy days and this organization's holidays. Now stay with me. From 70 AD of the destruction of the temple till 1500s, when Martin Luther came out with the Protestant Reformation, for 1,500 years, our Bibles was not even in English. There was just Greek and Hebrew writings, and then eventually the Catholic Church was putting some things in the Latin. But we, as American people, did not even have the Bible in English until the 1500s. So there was 1,500 years that went by when nobody was learning anything that spoke the English language. There was no revelation whatsoever. I mean, ask yourself, how could you grow spiritually if you couldn't read God's Word? How could you possibly be taught anything in God's Word if nobody was teaching you? This is how that one world order masked and controlled the world. 
And this is where the holidays came from instead of holy days. So, Jesus knew that this night was very important. And he even looked ahead and said that after I have been raised, and later we're going to see here that he knew that he had to be raised after three days. Verse 34, Jesus said unto them, Surely I say to you, this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Now, Jesus in verse 37, well, verse 36, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go, while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. Then he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, Father, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, listen, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples again and found them sleeping, and he said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me just for one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he said a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink of it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying what? The same words. Then he came to the disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour, that Mohedin, that appointed time by God, that specific hour. This is how specific God is. God looked down through the portal of time and through thousands of years he knew that there would be an appointed hour, that there would be a destined time that his son would be betrayed and handed over into the hands of sinners. Now, before this, we know that number three is the perfect number of completion. So when Jesus was praying to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he kept saying, please, look, I was praying about this when I was in Florida, and this word kept coming to me about this cup. And I thought, could he have possibly been talking about that? Because we're partaking in the communion today. I thought when he was talking about, please let this cup pass from me, was that Jesus really seeing in the, the fullness of time and the revelation and the laying out of all things that after this garden experience that he would be betrayed and there would be this remembrance of this time, of that cup, of that breaking of ourselves and that committing ourselves unto the kingdom of God. Was Jesus even asking the Father, listen, I've come this far. If it is even possible, let this cup pass from me. It's all about the communion. It's all about the remembering of the Passover. It's not about the Easter bunny. It's not about a bunch of eggs. It's not about Oster or Easter. And it's not about Good Friday and Easter Sunday. It's about the Passover. It's about God's Passover. Now watch. So this happened at night. Remember, in Matthew 26, verse 31. This night. Matthew 26, 31. This night. Matthew 26, verse 44. Behold, the hour is now at hand, and the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now is the hour. This is the night. So this gives us a time frame. This is an hour that this happened, and we know that it was at night. Well, we've been taught it was a Friday night. Is that true? It is a yes or a no answer. Is it true that Jesus died and was crucified as we have been taught that came out of the Holy Roman Catholic Church 
that Jesus was crucified on a Friday and that he was already out, well, no, that he rose on Sunday. Is that a true teaching or is it a heresy? Is it a lie and a misconception? So he says this. Verse 52 says, But Jesus said unto him, Put your sword in its place, for who who take the sword, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And do you, do you not think that I cannot now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than twenty, I mean with more than twelve legions of angels? How then can the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? Now I want you to put in your little sub note right there, right in your Bibles, Exodus 23, 20. Two big parts of our outreach are represented here. First of all, on the left is our His Food Ministry truck. We send this truck out every single Monday, Thursday, and Saturday to pick up food, and we do a free food giveaway at our church. Once again, that's every single Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then on the right is our Alpha Lion's Den Ministry church bus, where we pick up people and bring them to our church on Wednesday and Sunday. This is one of the times that when we do what we're supposed to do, that the Bible clearly teaches that God will dispatch an angel on your behalf. So Jesus knew what it said in Exodus 23, 20, and he was standing on God's word. So listen, when some of you get into the problems that you get into, you, you, this is what you think. You think, why is this happening to me? Listen, there's a reason why things happen to you. you got to figure out why and get yourself out of that situation. Now, I want you to go over because of time. We already established this is at night. So why just don't you over there in Matthew 26, 30, put Tuesday night. And in, in, in Matthew 26, 44, put Tuesday night when this hour happened because it was on a Tuesday night. I'm going to prove that to you. But I just don't want to lose you later. It was on Tuesday <coughs> night. Now, on Matthew, Matthew 27, Matthew 27, Matthew 27, verse 1, it says this, When morning came, when the morning came, well, here, here now we've already been through one night, now we're going into the next morning. So this would be Wednesday morning. So in my Bible right here in chapter 27, verse 1, I got Wednesday morning there. And right beside that I have written Mark 15, verse 1. Because Mark, in chapter 15, has the exact same breakdown of the days and times as Matthew does. So it's very clear that it's established by the word of two or more witnesses. That this is how it specifically took place. Now watch, this is the next morning. It says, when the next morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death because he had already been betrayed. When was he betrayed? It was the night before. It was a Tuesday night. So this is Wednesday morning. Now this day here, through this whole chapter, now I could go ahead and read the whole thing, but it would take up all the time. But I just want you to go over to this, Matthew 27, verse 15. Matthew 27, verse 15. Now people sometimes, when you talk about the feast days, they have a hard time with the feast days because they say they're not listed in the New Testament. Well, yes, they are. They're everywhere in the New Testament. You just haven't been taught them. So it hasn't been revealed to you yet, so you don't know where they are. But here's just one example of many that I could show you. But watch this. Matthew 27, verse 15 says this. Now, at the feast. Well, does that say at the feast? Yeah. Well, what feast are they talking about? It's the Passover feast. Well, how would you know that? Well, you have to know what the Passover is. And you'd have to know what, what the, the feasts of God are. See, we believe that there are seven feasts of God. 
Passover, when God had to send his son Jesus, that he had to die for us. Unleavened bread, he had to go into the tomb. Feast of first fruits, he had to raise from the dead. And Pentecost, those are the first fours, the spring feasts. Then there's three fall feasts. There's the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. God has to fulfill all them. Well, right now he's completed the first four, and we're waiting on the second now, the final three. So with this feast, you have to know what feast this points to and pertains to, and why. This would be the Passover. So now at the feast, it doesn't say Easter. Now at Easter, the governor was accustomed to release. No, it doesn't say Easter. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished, and at that time they had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. So you, you know what happened here. This all just happens all on Wednesday. It, it talks about his, his um, standing, what happened to Barabbas. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a, a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this innocent, of this just person. You see to it yourself. This all happened on Wednesday. So the next, the next time frame that we're given is this. It says here that there was two robbers in Matthew 27, 38. Then two robbers were crucified with Jesus. One on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wait, uh, waging their hands and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, hey, look, he saved others. He cannot even save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have for he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him were involved him with the same thing. Now, from the sixth hour, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, well, when would this be? Listen, this would be from 12 o'clock. God is this specific. From 12 o'clock on Wednesday, it says, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the entire land. So from 12 o'clock Wednesday till 3 o'clock Wednesday, there was darkness over the entire land. The crucifixion itself began about the third hour of the day, which would have been 9 in the morning. But when it hit about 12 o'clock, there was darkness over the entire land for three hours from the six o'clock, I mean from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard this said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. <laughs> then in verse 51, this is very important because it says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised from the dead. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Verse 57. Now, now when evening had come. Well, this would be the evening of Wednesday. This is Wednesday evening. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself also became a disciple of Jesus. This man went into Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him, given to him. And when Joseph had taken the body and wrapped it in a linen cloth and had laid it in a new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, 
And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. And on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, remember, while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until when? Until the third day. So they even knew that there was this three-day period. There was three full-day periods that had to take place. Now why, why is this timing so important? Because it's important to God. Listen, he said there was darkness over the entire earth from the sixth hour till the ninth hour for a reason. And he tells you exactly here when Jesus gave up the ghost, the Holy Spirit. And then he says, when evening had come, there was a rich man from Arimathea. Why? Because at 6 p.m. or when the sun sat that day, it began the next day. Now listen, my friends, this is what's important for you to understand. The day after that Wednesday was a Sabbath day. That Sabbath day started that Wednesday at 6 p.m. according to God's calendar. This is why Joseph of Arimathea had to risk his life by going to Pontius Pilate and say, listen, I want the body of Jesus. Why? Because he had to get him in the tomb. He had to prepare his body and get it wrapped up before the Sabbath. When did the Sabbath start? It wasn't on Saturday. It wasn't that Sabbath. It was the Sabbath of the Passover. Now see, if you've not been taught to feast days, there's no way you can put this together. This is why this has been hidden from the church for thousands of years. First of all, because we've been in a period of dark ages where we didn't even have this Bible in English for 1,500 years. So it's only been roughly 500 years, which would probably be about 10 generations, that men like, or women like you and I have even been studying this book. I mean, you really start studying, you find out it's a whole different book than what you thought when you first start reading it. God is extremely deep. So when he wanted you to know these specific times, they're there for a reason. Look, let's go back to Leviticus 23. Go back to Leviticus 23. I guess show you something. Leviticus 23. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus 23. Watch this. Leviticus 23. Now, watch this. The, Leviticus 23, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, These are the feasts of the Lord. These are not Jewish feasts. They're not Gentile feasts. These are God's days. Which you shall proclaim. This is another aspect of our outreach. We have the Dairy Junior High School that our ministry purchased and what we did is we put apartments, we refurbished apartments across the top of this building that we rent out to families. So this is another very large part of our ministry. It means to preach, teach, and instruct to be holy convocations. The holy convocations means a dress rehearsal. They need, you need to know how to do them, when to do them, and why to do them. That's where the holy convocation is. Do you hear that? This is extremely important. God said, first of all, these are my days. There are nobody else's, they're his. Secondly, he commands us to proclaim these. And this word in the Hebrew and the Greek means to preach, teach, and instruct. 
those three things you should be doing about these seven days. Then he says they're holy convocation. Well, what does that mean? That word holy convocation means a dress rehearsal. Now listen, Adam just did some great work over there in the apartments for us putting things together, right? Now if I go over there to Adam and I'd say, Adam, okay, it's your job, you do it the way you're supposed to do it, and then I go over there and I just want to throw the carpet down the first day. Adam would say, oh, oh, oh whoa, what, wait a second, what are you doing? I'd say, I'm putting the carpet down. He'd say, you're not supposed to put the carpet down on the first day. I mean, I need to frame it, I need to put up the drywall, then I need to do this, then I need to put the ceiling in, then I need to prime it, then I need to paint it, then I need to do all this and do all that, then we have a carpet come in and carpet put in. Right? So there's a way to do things. Listen, do you get up in the morning and put all your clothes on and then go in the shower? <laughs> no, I hope not. You'd be wet in church. <laughs> There is a way that you do things. So God, when God said, these are not just convocations. If you look up the word convocation, it means something similar or like a dress rehearsal. He said, these are holy convocations. These are something different, just like at a wedding. When you go and a bride comes in and you play her music and she comes down the aisle. How about if you did that, like, when the, when the uh, first couple was coming in before anything started? The bride would be like, what are they doing out there? That's my song. Well, no, that couple just wanted it to play right then. Well, who cares what the couple thought? Do you see what I'm getting at? These are holy convocations that God said would take place on specific time. So let's go on a little further. Let's look at verse 4. These are Gentile feasts. No. These are Jewish feasts. No. These are whose? They're the Lord's. They're God's. He said these are the feasts of the Lord. They're what? Holy convocations. Now listen. In order to come in to a wedding and to know what to do at the wedding. See, a lot of Christians think they're going to the wedding feast. They've never practiced the wedding feast. They don't even know when the Passover is. They don't even, they've never honored the Passover in 30 years of service to Jesus. They're worshiping a foreign god, an idol. It's just, just a thought. I'm, I'm just saying. That's my new thing, I'm just saying. So then you can't stone me because I'm just saying. I'm just giving you something to think about, so don't get mad at me. These are holy convocations, now listen, which you shall proclaim, which means what? Preach, teach, and instruct. Now, when I said it in the first thing, I just said to preach, teach, and instruct. But now would God want us to preach, teach, and instruct them at a specific time even? Yes. Because look what he says. This is very important. Their holy convocations or dress rehearsals, which you shall proclaim, which means preach, teach, and instruct. Instruct. Well, when? At their appointed times. Well, when are their appointed times? Listen, I need to ask you a question. This way you need to answer yourself. <laughs> are these appointed times of God? Are they Christmas and Easter? You need to make up your mind if that is a true teaching or not. I say it's not. And I can prove it. I can show you beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's not Christmas and Easter. Now, if you want to adjust accordingly, that's between you and God. I'm just saying. There are appointed times by God. So if you're out worshiping and teaching and preaching in error, somebody got to tell you the truth. I'm just saying. I'm just telling you what the truth is. So what? Is God specific? God says, on the 14th day 
of the first month. Now, is he talking about January? No. Because listen, that same old devil, that same old demon spirit of the Antichrist that worked through that Roman Catholic Church, that world rule church at the beginning, they made January 1st the first day of the year. They made their own calendar. So they got all the Gentile people thinking that the calendar starts in January. God, when God says the first month, he's not talking about January. So we have this great, well, they have this great celebration called New Year's Eve. It is one of the greatest pagan celebrated holidays in the world, in the history of the world. And we got churches that honor it today. And yet they won't do nothing on it on Abim. They'll get mad at you if you talk about Abim in the Passover. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So on the 14th day of the first month of twilight, this is what? This is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month, this is the feast of unleavened bread. To who? To the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. But listen. Hello, is everybody with me? On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. You know what that is? It's a Sabbath day. But you shall offer an offering made on the seventh day. It shall also be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So listen. Joseph of Arimathea and all the disciples knew that that Wednesday at 6 p.m. and that evening started this Sabbath day. The day after the Passover, that evening was a Sabbath. It started at sunset, sundown that evening. So Joseph of Arimathea knew he had to get the body of Jesus and get it in the temple before 6 p.m. on that Wednesday. This is extremely important for you to understand this. The Garden of Gethsemane was Tuesday night. Jesus' betrayal was Tuesday night. He was set before Pilate Wednesday morning. The crucifixion began Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. till about 12, 12 a.m. I mean at 12 o'clock there became darkness over the entire earth for three hours. At 3 p.m. on that same day, which was a Wednesday, darkness was over the entire earth. Jesus gave up the spirit at 3 o'clock. Sometime after that, Joseph of Arimathea came with some of the disciples and asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. They had to get it prepared before 6 o'clock because they would have been put to death. If it was any time after that, they would have violated the Sabbath and they would have had to be stoned. So they had to get his body in that tomb that Joseph, that no man had ever laid in. Get him prepared and get him in the tomb. I'm running out of time already. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. But see, listen, we'll pick this up next week. I'd rather go a little slower, make sure you get all this. Because now what we're going to see is God is honored these days. God himself is honored these days from the time that he had spoke that. Now, if these are important to God, they should be important to us. <clears throat> this month, Abim, is the most holy month. There's only three times that God proclaimed this. Three months. Three times, I mean. Passover, Pentecost, when he sent the Holy Ghost. See, listen. Passover was the first time a part of the Godhead came to the earth. It was Jesus. The second time, the second feast, is Pentecost, is when Jesus dispatched the Holy Ghost to the earth. And the third time, the Feast of Tabernacles, is when Jesus is returning. These three times are the most holy times of the year. This is why all the Jews are commanded to go to Jerusalem during these times. There's so much I can teach you off of this. 
I'm going to try to go through it slow just so you can begin to understand the importance of the Passover. See, listen, we're going to partake in communion this morning. Do you, do you know the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians? It says, for this reason, there are many sick among you and many sleep. Why? Because they do not know how to rightly judge their own bodies concerning the Passover meal. It's not the Last Supper. It's the Passover meal. And when Jesus taught and instructed us, Jesus never talked about the Easter Bunny. Now I know it's all nice and fluffy and it'll get people mad at me, but listen, it's not about the Easter Bunny. And it's not about fat old Santa Claus. But that makes people mad because they've been taught these things since they were young. And even the Bible itself says, train up a child in the way he shall go when he's old, he won't depart from it. So even when you show them truth right now, people want to defend this bunny and Easter and all these things in Christmas in their lies, their deception. Why not just speak the truth? Why not just speak the truth? What is wrong with speaking the truth? I'm just saying. I'm just saying this because I love you. That's why I'm saying it. And when I think and I listen to people and people are just like, I mean, it's sad. It's really sad that people haven't been taught the truth. But we're going to try to get the truth out in love. And we understand everybody's in the position <coughs> they are, but the truth will set them free. Amen? Amen? What you view right here is our parsonage. We've rented out this parsonage to families for 15 years. And then right to the right of the parsonage, you will be able to view our church. But as I said, all these are parts of our ministry. We're a multifaceted ministry, and I really want to share that with you being the senior pastor of Alpha Lions Den Ministry, so you know really what our ministry represents. Well, listen, we're going to have communion this morning. We're going to celebrate the Passover. We're going to do this. Jesus said as often as you do this, you shall do this in remembrance of me. You'll proclaim my death until I return back to the earth. Listen, I just think we need to open up the altar this morning before we partake of communion. Hi, my name is Pastor Ronald Kozar, and right now I've been pastoring a church in Derry, Pennsylvania for approximately 16 years. I have known Jesus as my Lord and Savior for 41 years. And during this time, God has given me a burden for the body of Christ. Three specific things is spiritually, physically, and financially. I'm going to share with you a story that is so powerful and life-changing regarding some of the things that have happened in my life in the last two years. About two years ago, I was having a problem with my vision. I didn't tell anybody, but I was going through this difficulty of seeing and just struggling with this. And I've watched so many people struggle in the church with different things physically. And I understand this, if you're going through a physical problem, it's going to affect you spiritually. So I have a burden, I have a burden for the body of Christ. So today's show is going to be able to help you help others physically, which will also help them spiritually. So I, I have this burden to get back to my, back to my story. And I'm struggling with this as, as so many other people struggle. 
And I look at people in the body of Christ who struggle with being overweight, who struggle with diabetes, who struggle with macular degeneration, who struggle with arthritis, which gets into our back and our hips and our knees, and all these issues that I watch people in the body of Christ struggle with. And here I was, a former NFL football player, pastoring a church. Now everybody would have thought that I had my life all together. But as I said, two years ago, two years ago, almost to the day, I began to lose my sight. And I went through this struggle of really trusting God. As I, as I was, my vision was declining, I knew that God spoke to me one day and he said that I will send you an answer. And sometimes that's all you have and that's all you need is a word from God. And God has transformed my life. Today you're gonna hear of a story that is mind boggling how God can bring healing into your physical body through natural holistic products. God has really blessed a man by the name of Noel Turner from New Zealand with these products and I heard about them and that's what you're going to hear on on this show it's a it's a all-natural way to bring health and restoration to your physical body so I was in our church I struggled with this for about six months by myself I didn't tell anybody and I was in the bottom of our basement helping my wife Deborah with the food ministry and I thought I ha had something in my left eye and when I closed my left eye and I looked out of my right eye I was blind I couldn't see anything, and it really scared me. So they rushed me to, the, to an eye specialist, and then that eye specialist said that they had to take me to an optometrist. Now he looked at me and he told me that I had this thing happen in my eye, which is an occlusion. Now an occlusion is totally different from macular degeneration, because an occlusion is like a stroke inside your eyeball. So all my veins had ruptured. There was a, a, an explosion inside my eye. And thank God that it did not go out the back of my eye because it probably would have killed me from a brain aneurysm. But my eye was strong enough to hold the fluids. But what it did is it pushed the pupil out the front of my eye, causing me to go blind, not to see. So the only thing that I found out is I had to, I had to see a doctor. And the doctor told me the only way to, to, to be able to treat this is I had to get a shot in my eye once a month for 16 months. I had to go in once a month and get a shot in my eye. And, and the whole time I just prayed about an answer. I said, God, you said that you were going to send me an answer. And just like many of you today, you struggle physically and that affects you spiritually. So if you're struggling with overweight, being diabetic, or diabetes, macular degeneration, or if you have arthritic issues, bad back, hips, knees, anything like that. Inflammation is the number one cause to all these issues. So we have the answer today. And I wanna bring you some good news. But listen, you need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when you when you need change, when you want change, when you're sick and tired of that, God will send you the answer. So call some friends, tell them to tune in. It's going to be a great show. Hi, I'm Pastor Ronald Kozor, and you just got done watching a video that we had put together about a year ago now. And this is just a brief summary and a testimony. I could not wait to come back and share this with you to prove the product of Freezor. Because let's face it, the people that don't try it, they do not believe that it works. But me, firsthand experience, I know this, a person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person who has an argument. So what you just heard on that brief little testimony clip was my beginning stages of experimenting with the Freezor product. And now today, when we're making this video for you, is over one year later. Now, if we go back a year ago when, when you just saw the video that we put together, I was going blind in this eye and I just began to receive my sight. My knees were coming back. Everybody thought, well, that could be working and it could not be working. Well, now it's been over a year. I just went to my eye doctor and they tested my eyes again. 
My vision is actually 2016. There is no fluid in my eye whatsoever. My eye has healed back 100%. Now, previous to my, to my beginnings with the Freezor product, my eye was filling up with blood. I was hemorrhaging with inside my eyeball. And I actually have the scans of every single month for 16 long months. I had received a shot in my eye. And I started to take the Freezor product and, and honestly, I am telling you, it healed my eyes up. It's been over one year now, and I have 2016 vision, perfect vision, no more shots, thank you, Jesus. My knees, my right knee was absolutely shot. I had no cartilage in my leg whatsoever. My left leg was going. Here we are one year later, taking a Freezor product. I take two Omegas every morning, and two every night, two a stacks of thin every morning and two at night. And I also take the weight loss shakes. So listen, if you're having problem with your knees or any type of arthritis, one year later, I ride the bike now three days a week, five miles every single time. I go in and work out for my legs twice a week. And uh, things are absolutely incredible. So if you're struggling with weight loss, that's number one. I take the, the weight loss protein. Uh, shakes that Freezor has. I actually started out taking the children's shake. So they have two of those um, shakes. One is chocolate, one is vanilla. You could switch them back and forth. That's what I started to lose weight. Now, I lost 45 pounds, 45 pounds by taking the, the weight loss, just the shakes. And then off of the other two products that I said, the omega-3 and the astaxanthin, I've got my eyesight back, so it helps you with weight loss. If you're diabetic, we've helped so many people that, are, that have diabetes or struggling that are diabetics. I really encourage you to try it. The next thing is, is those that struggle with arthritis, neck, back, or knee pain. I am telling you, it will fight, the, it's an anti-inflammatory. I believe it's one of the best in the world. It has absolutely changed my life. So we have a 90 day, a three month money back guarantee. And if you call in, you'll see an information page at the, at the end of this, <laughs> and you can dial the 800 number. That is 1-888-962-4888. Tell them Pastor Ron sent you, you'll buy a bottle and get a bottle free. Then you got a 90 day money back guarantee. If the product does not work for you, and you are unsatisfied with the product, ship it back in and get your money back. But I am telling you folks, it worked for me. I lost 45 pounds, I got my eyesight back, my legs, my knees are doing fine, my back, I saw a chiropractor for arthritis in my back for 14 years, and I have not seen a chiropractor for my back or anything else in the past year since I started taking the Freezor free products. So I'm telling you, it worked for me, and I know it'll work for you. And what do you have to lose? It's a money back guarantee. So please give it a, give it a shot. You could go to my website, you'll also see that on our information page, which we'll be following after this video. But my website is team, T-E-A-M, Freezor, F-R-E-Z-Z-O-R.com, forward slash Pastor Ron. Go to the website, check out the products, listen to the doctors on there, listen to the testimonies. It's a phenomenal website. Then dial the 800 number. It's 888-962-4888. Tell them Pastor Ron sent you, buy a bottle, buy your first bottle, they'll give you a bottle free. You can't beat that. So it, it's a great way to get started. And listen, I'm, I'm here just to help you because I know that pain, I know how bad that hurts. So I, I want the best for you. Just try it, and I hope it'll help you. So God bless you, and I'll be talking to you again. I pray that you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Till next time, see ya.